Fantastic. Good afternoon. Welcome to the 62nd faculty lectureship at NDSU. My name is Mark Narot. On behalf of the Faculty Awards and Recognition Committee, I would like to, uh, like to welcome the relatives and friends of Cheryl Walkenheim and all the members of the community, President Cook, Provost Bertolini, faculty, staff, students, and everyone joining us online. This year, the committee has recognized Dr. Cheryl Walkenheim as a recipient of the lectureship, one of the most prestigious of all awards at NDSU. We'd also like to recognize this afternoon, Dr. Jenny Mumpson, Professor of Biological Sciences, she's here, and Mukun Sibi, Distinguished Professor of Chemistry and Biochemistry, who were nominated for this honor and were selected as finalists by the awards committee. The faculty lectureship recognizes achievements in the three areas of teaching, scholarship and creative activity, and service. Dr. Walkenheim has achieved impressive accomplishments in each of these areas, and you will hear more about them in a few moments. Uh, Dr. Walkenheim is the most recent uh, of more than 50 recipients of NDSU's faculty uh, lectureships dating back to 1957, with professors speaking on a range of topics, including grass on the prairies, Arctic exploration, climate change, the geology under Fargo, communication as a relationship, how groups think, feel, and decide, monolingualism, what history tells us about teaching and learning, and the conductor's art. Following Dr. Walkenheim's talk, there will be time for questions. Those joining us remotely uh, will be able to submit questions online then. We'll sift through the questions and read aloud those that we can fit into the time allowed. After that, President Cook will present the Faculty Lectureship Award. Following the ceremony, we hope that you join us for a reception in Butte Lounge, for cake and refreshments. I'll now turn this over to Dr. Greg Lardy, Vice President of Agricultural Affairs, who will introduce this year's Faculty Lectureship Awardee. Thanks, Greg. Thank you, Mark. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Cheryl Wackenheim. Cheryl is a Professor of Agribusiness and Applied Economics. Since joining NDSU in 1998, Professor Walkenheim has taught more than 120 course offerings to more than 5,000 students. She has taught, also taught at Renmin University in China as a visiting Fulbright Distinguished Chair in 2015 and 2016. Walkenheim is a Lieutenant Colonel in the Missouri in, in the Minnesota National Ar Minnesota National Army Guard, and has 23 military awards, including the Bronze Star and Combat Action Award. Professor Walkenheim has mentored numerous students and faculty at NDSU, and as a member of the Army National Guard, she has mentored dozens of military and non-commissioned officers and foreign nationals. Professor Walkenheim, quote, has made a positive difference in the lives of many students, faculty, and others. Her success in mentoring comes from her dedication to knowing the person she is mentoring, including their strengths and challenges, their career and personal goals, as well as their experiences. Her 58 manuscripts include 10 as a sole author and 21 as first author. Her Vita notes 172 presentations, including 49 international presentations. And she has been principal investigator or co-principal investigator on more than 60 grants totaling $2.15 million. She earned her bachelor's degree at the University of Minnesota and her master's degree in agricultural economics and master's of business administration and doctorate in agricultural economics from Michigan State University. Among Walkenheim's many honors include Agricultural and Applied Economics Association Distinguished Teaching Award, Challey Faculty Fellow, Fulbright Distinguished Chair Scholarship, China Agricultural Economic Review High Citation Award, the H. Rold and Janet Lund Excellence in Teaching Award, the NDSU Excellence in Mentoring Award, the Jordan A. Engberg Endowed Professorship, Tri-College University Excellence in Innovation and Adaptive Education Awards, and the Regional USDA Food and Agriculture Sciences Excellence in Teaching Award. You can see Dr. Walkenheim is exceptionally well qualified to present this lecture, and so I'd like to call Dr. Walkenheim to the podium.
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lardy. Okay, they were very concerned about the microphone not working. So thank you very much for coming. I, I realize I am the uh, in the way of a Friday afternoon, like during lake season, and we've had a tough go of it, haven't we? So I, I very much appreciate that you're here, and I'm honored to be here. The light is very bright. There, okay, perfect. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I'm just representing all the excellence here at NDSU. Um, I'm in the College of Agriculture, Food Systems, and Natural Resources, and I'm delighted to be in this college. It's an amazing opportunity to do a lot of things. Agriculture makes up about, uh, I think we said $18 billion in direct receipts for the state of North Dakota and $12 billion in indirect receipts. So it, it's an amazing part of of the economy in North Dakota. I work for a wonderful chair. We, we started at the same time, Dr. William Banji. So I, I'm really just surrounded by incredible people and, and given a lot of support. And there's a lot of people behind me sort of helping me, but they're sort of letting me do sort of what I wanna do, right? As long as it contributes to the state of North Dakota and we have that mission. And I'm really excited to be here to talk about it. Um, the other finalists are, are really smart people, but everybody's excited about economics, right? <laughs> so here I am. So I'm gonna talk about behavioral economics. Um, I'm just gonna start, I, I'm gonna start with who I am because that's really affects what I do. And there's sort of three things that who I am. I'm a teacher and researcher here at NDSU, right? That's me. I'm a mother. How many of you have children or have little brothers or sisters at one point in your life? Or you have nieces and nephews? You were children? Okay, we got everybody, right? So in fact, um, they have a huge influence on my life and a lot of what I do in, in my research sort of resonates from learning with them. We spent uh, two years together in, in the living room during the COVID and, and I have never learned so much in my entire life about how young people think. Um, and that's just what they let me see. The other part is the military, right? So I'm in the military, I joined the military, I wanted to be a heavy wheeled vehicle mechanic. I wanted to have somebody pay me to learn a skill and it's something they do in our family. So I thought it would be kind of fun, right? And it's 25 years later and I'm still in the military. We have drill this weekend, right? So it's been, been quite a ride and I've learned a lot as well. So these things will come into my presentation. So these are sort of founding fathers in economics, right? You see David Ricardo and Adam Smith in the Invisible Hand, um, John Maynard Keynes, and so on. These people I put up there because this is still what a lot of economic theory is based on. And in particular, and there's economists here, so you can just, uh, during question and answer time, you can uh, raise some questions about my presentation. When I say we, I'm being a very generalist, but we sort of assume a, a rational economic person. Right? We assume the people that make decisions are doing so with full information, or at least good information. Right? They know what's out there, they know what's available and how that will affect whatever it is they're doing. They have very well-defined preferences, they know what they want, um, they're rational, and, and they um, work in their own self-interest. Right? They're, they're trying to make themselves happy. And, and we like that person, oh, only that person doesn't exist. right? But I think I was really excited. I think I found him, <laughs> right? This guy knows what he likes. He has well-defined preferences. Um, he, we could say he's rational, right? Maybe his spouse doesn't think so, but, but this is as close as I found. But we know that person doesn't exist. But I wanna talk about economics because that's what we do, right? So economists characterize how people buy with the graph on the left. We assume people are going out there trying to get maximize their utility, make them as happy as possible, given a budget constraint. We have these insatiable wants, right? How many of you took economics and recognized that graph? Awesome, right? And then on the, the right side here, we have on the producer side, right? They're trying to make the right product in the right amount to maximize profit. And, and again, we were economists, we think that's good, right? Profit maximization, um, utility maximization, this is how we drive the world, right? And it's how we understand things. And then interreality, right? This is people, this is suppo supposed to, this two-dimensional graph is supposed to explain this individual's behavior. And, and this graph is supposed to 
um, reflect on how firms make decisions. So it gets a little messy, right? Sometimes I lose my thought, right? So we go ahead, um, we go ahead and try to understand people using our theory, but there is a sometimes a large error term, right? We don't how people behave doesn't really reflect our expectations. Has that happened to you in your research? What you expect didn't happen? Anybody? Right. Okay, I feel better already. We're like a family, right? So um so what do we do about that? Well, that's what I'm going to talk about behavioral economics. We, we went to the psychologists and, and we sort of stole their thunder, but we need it because we have to explain why our models are not, not perfect, right? So, so we do that. We work with behavioral economics. I'm going to talk about stuff and I'm going to essentially talk about how you can interfere with people's lives to change their behavior, right? That's the heavy stuff, right? Um, but I want to talk about freedom because while we're doing this, people like freedom, freedom of choice. It's a, it's a fundamental core of, of the U.S., for example, that people get to make choices on their own behalf, and it's very important. So as I talk about these, sort of in the back of your mind, does the person have choice remaining after we have done that? Okay. Oh, it's going the wrong way. I had a speaker talk about chat GTP. How many of you are familiar with chat GTP, right? Whoa. I asked my students, how many of you have used chat GTP to help you on a paper? And one guy raised his hand proudly and then <laughs> other hands sort of went up a little bit. Um, it, it's amazing. So I asked it, you know, and I, I recognize I get this. I asked it, could you please write me a presentation on behavioral economics? And it said, right away, it said, no, 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 no. We don't do PowerPoint presentations, but here's an outline. It was amazing, right? That's what you're hearing today. <laughs> the pictures are mine, right? So this technology is amazing. So they have told me it's always good to start with a joke, right? So I asked chat, GTP, could you please give me a couple of really funny economic jokes? And usually it's fast, right? So it paused. <laughs> like 20 seconds went by and nothing happened. And then it slowly kicked out a couple and it essentially said, these may not be funny. <laughs> so I'm not gonna share them with you. But, but what I did get out of it, I said, well, why don't you write me a poem about behavioral economics? And, and that's what we have here. Um, I'm gonna read it because the people back in the army, when I get there tonight, they're gonna say, what did you do this afternoon? And I'm gonna say, I was at a poetry reading, <laughs> okay? This came out of an artificial intelligence and it could have been my presentation, right? So in the world of economics, there's a field quite new that seeks to understand how humans behave. It's true. It's called behavioral economics and it's a sight to see as it explores the mysteries of our psychology, right? It delves into the choices we make each day and the reasons why we sometimes go astray, see why we don't predict the way people behave. And it looks at the biases that cloud, cloud our minds and the irrationalities that we often find. It shows how we're influenced by social cues and the way we're swayed by emotional hues. It covers the power of defaults and nudges and how they can change our behavior with just a few touches. Are right, getting in? This is behavioral economics. Um, behavioral economics remind us that we're not always rational human beings and our actions are sometimes uh, influenced by unseen strings. So let us embrace this new perspective with Glee and use it to understand our actions, you and me. It's good, right? I love this thing. <laughs> right. Okay. So this is this is my hero. Um, Dr. Richard Thaler, he won a, a Nobel Peace Prize in 2017 for sharing with the world behavioral economics and the important role it plays. He also is a simplest, right? He's awesome. This is the most important thing he said, if you want people to do something, make it easy. And that's what behavioral economics is, is based on. So what I'm gonna talk about, um, there's lots of different things that we look at in behavioral economics, how we can influence people's behavior and how we can better understand it. Now, apparently I can't talk all night and it's Friday, right? So I, I honed it down a little bit to these. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna tell you about these. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about um, 
any concerns that we have about behavioral economics. Okay, you with me? So I'm going to start with bounded self-interest because that's what really got me going in, in behavioral economics. It really got me interested. And this is not my area of expertise, but it's certainly my highest area of interest as an economist, right? How many of you want to be economists now that you've heard that? About? <laughs> Only the economists are raising their hand, right? So, huh. Okay. Bounded self-interest. So I did a study, one of my first academic studies. I was at Illinois State University, so I didn't make the mistake here, right? Um, I did a study with her, certified Herford beef who was trying to establish a brand. You've all heard of certified Angus beef. Um, have you heard of certified Herford beef? Probably because I did the study, the beef guys, right? <laughs> Probably because I did the study and, and directed them incorrectly. Essentially, we did an intercept study in a grocery store. So we asked... Uh, individuals who came in at that time it was 25 years ago mostly women came in and, and we showed them different packaging different prices cuts of beef with or without marbling with a different fat edge around it we asked them what do you like what most appeals to you about this because they were trying to establish a brand this is our beef and in fact we got a lot of results we published a paper so I did the academic thing right but then I noticed as it came on the market, they weren't really following my direction. And, and it turns out it was because of bounded rationality. Because when they came in the store, I shouldn't have asked them what they like, right? I should have asked them what they are going to buy for their family. And that doesn't seem like a big distinction to you, but let me show you because... Um, I, I send, I take pictures of myself at the gym to encourage my children to go to the gym at their respective universities, right? You can tell I, I don't spend a lot of time there, but enough to take a picture, right? This is my favorite pizza. How many like pizza? All right. This is my favorite pizza. It has everything on it, vegetables, meat, everything that you could ask for, right? You ask me, what is my favorite, what is my favorite pizza? I'm going to point to this one, right? Now, what happened was I had children. They had the, those little guys get in the way, right? So my son doesn't like vegetables. I mean, how can somebody not like vegetables, right? He doesn't. How many of your children don't like vegetables? Okay. I'm reminded of a study you told me about where you couldn't understand why people overreported their vegetable eating, and it turns out we think French fries are a vegetable, <laughs> right? <laughs> All right, so he doesn't like vegetables. No problem, because I can eat meat, right? So we started getting our pizzas with loads of meat on them, right? Get rid of the vegetables, get the meat, we're all good to go. And then one day my, um, my children came home. I want to make sure their parents, who both work here, are not here. My, my, my daughter had a best friend that just lived a, a few blocks away. And she came home one day and she said, Mom, I've become a veterinarian. And I was like, wow, that, that happened really fast, right? I, apparently she meant vegetarian, but it took us a few hours. So she decided she didn't want to eat meat, right? My world fell apart. And my world fell apart because of this. This is the pizza I want. This is the pizza that we buy. So if you're an economist, we want to know why people buy stuff. That's what we're all about, making money, right? So if you ask me, what do I want? This is what happens. If you ask me and during that very dismal period of my life, what I buy, this was it, right? It seems like a simple example, but for economists and marketing professors and so on, other academics that are doing research, the, the distinction is huge because people don't act in their own self-interest. They act in the self-interest how is defined by their unit however that is defined. And it's changed the way I do research. It's not just, um, you know, I ask people what they would buy, but I interview people together. I work a lot with farmers and I no longer interview the farmer. You know, I interview the farmer and his wife or, or husband, the farmer and their partners or their children. And I get a lot of different answers. So it's really important, this concept to me. Y'all get it? Okay, second concept I, I like is heuristics. And there's a lot of thing in there, a lot of things in there. And I made you this a pretty diagram. It's good, right? 
I was going to use a common use, but this is my own my own presentation. So heuristics is the idea that even though when we're making a decision, we get a lot of input from others, some welcome, some un unwelcome. We get some information from Google and so on. We make a choice, but we don't just make a choice. We go and investigate different alternatives sometimes and, and get more input as we go along. You know, you shouldn't. How many of you have been pregnant or had a, a spouse or a friend that was pregnant? Have you ever heard the term pregnancy police? Just me? I, I, when, when, the first time I was pregnant, I, I had no idea how interested people were in my coffee consumption and so on. People were always giving me, you know, I had put its decaf on my chest, right? People were, were telling me what and what not to consume, right? A lot of input as I went about life making a decision. I had to, you know, hide my coffee in a, in a soda bottle, right? So what heuristics does for us is it simplifies the decision. We just make a decision based on something we already understand and know. So anything that falls under heuristics just helps us simplify the decision so that we don't have all these distractions. And the first one I'm going to talk about is authority. What do you think about these people? Raise your hand if you selected your do your doctor here in Fargo or your home home area based on their medical qualifications, including, for example, their education, the number of people they have saved, and so on. Other important doctor things. How many of you selected your doctor that way? Of course, you did, Jeremy. <laughs> you did too. How many of you selected your doctor for some other reason? Just to make sure everybody's raising their hand, right? What are those reasons? Recommendation, who, who recommended it? Is that important to you? A friend, a friend that you trust. Did they make the decision based on the qualifications of the doctor? No idea, right. Anybody else? Location, availability? Gender. Gender, okay. When I got here, I, I didn't have a doctor. I, I go to the VA, but I, did, I wanted a regular doctor, right? So I asked my colleague, Bob Hearn. And he had selected his doctor based on the fact that they went to Harvard, which I thought was a good reason. But in reality, I have no idea if my doctor is a good doctor or not. I have no idea. Do I like them? Do they call me the morning after and see if everything's okay? Um, do, they, do they clean up well? Whatever it is, right? It has nothing to do with their, their skills as a physician. And the same with the priest. The priest, I don't get to choose, right? But these people bring forward a certain credibility right? Because of their uniform. Now look at this, this priest, right? If you ran into him, little trust, right? <laughs> what if you saw him jogging, right? The same thing? Instant credibility? No, it, it's just a, an authority. We assign them certain, um, we assign people certain things. And authority is awesome because it turns out that if you're working, if you're working, how many of you do consulting activities or otherwise work outside of NDSU? It's it's allowed, right? So if you have somebody answer your phone, right, Frayne, you're gonna somebody calls in for a consulting job, just have somebody answer the phone and say, Hi, this is Frayne Olson's office. May I help you? And they say, Well, we're looking for Frayne because we want him to be able to tell us whether or not we should build a new elevator, right? So in fact, the receptionist just has to say, Hey, you've come to the right place. Brain Olson has been on the faculty for over 20 years. He has recommended these sorts of logistical and storage issues to over 84 clients, and he's just who you need, right? That could be his child saying that. It doesn't matter. It, the research shows it doesn't matter who provides you the credibility, but you can put that to use by making sure that there's somebody that makes you sound good because people will accept it like this. I sound good, right, Dr. Lardy? And Dr. Maynard. All right, so let's go to Afghanistan. That's Afghanistan. How many of you know all the countries around Afghanistan? There's so many stands, aren't there? Right, so they, they told me they're going to send me to Afghanistan, right? And I said, what you say in the army? Yes, that's fine. Great, let's go, right? So they sent me there to Afghanistan. Um, there it is, right? It was very, most of our um, combat officers were very rural. They dropped in. Um, Food and water. Um, this is me eating with the, we're often co-located with the Afghan army, their Afghan police. So one thing you'll notice is we have, this is an Afghan army guy. Does he look like an army guy? 
he has a, a track suit on, right? Do you, this is me with my head scarf, not looking army-ish, not looking very with a lot of military bearing, which is sort of my problem, right? I look goofy. You give me a gun, you give me the uniform, I still look goofy. And that doesn't work in the army because the army is all about military bearing, right? It's important that you have that. And, and I don't have that. And there's my job, right? Whether I was vaccinating animals or trying to explain to Afghan farmers that bees are not stealing their pollen. And that sort of thing was what we were doing there, right? But I was a goof, right? Kind of a, I, I was a little benign, didn't have a seat at the table. Went out on this particular mission. That's a full-grown cow, those of you in agriculture in Afghanistan, right? Amazingly small. Um, I came back from this mission. I lived with another unit that had switched out when I was um, about halfway through my tour. And all of a sudden, I had a seat at the table. It was like that. People wanted to be involved in my missions. They wanted to do joint missions. You know, while you're vaccinating cows, I'm going to be doing this, this thing, right? All of a sudden, I had a seat, a physical seat at the table. They had week, two, two times a week meetings. And all of a sudden, I had a name tag there. It was amazing. What happened? What do you think happened? We're talking about authority. What do you think happened? Somebody Googled me. They found out I'm not goofy. They found out this is my job, right? This is my job. And I have these degrees. And they'll go, whoa. So now I just, you know, I tell all the army people that right away. I have a PhD, right? <laughs> It was just that, that made all the difference in the world. And now as you're going through life, it's an important thing to remember. Okay, I wanna talk about default and anchoring. This is another heuristic, what makes our life easy. Now anchoring, I won't show any examples of, but anchoring is essentially the idea that people value what they know. Sort of the last person that told them something. For example, I'm selling my car to you, Tim. And I say to you, it's, $17,000, you say, it was not what you were expecting when he talked in, you know, you went in blue book and you saw it was about 13,000. So when I said 17,000, you're like, whoa, right? But I've set the bar. Now we're gonna talk about that. Be first in anchoring. What do I do for my students? Students have um, expectations of us, right? How, how, how fast should you be grading your exams? When do students start asking? Immediately after what? I tell them, I, like I told them what day they're going to get their final grades on, right? I told them, I tell them 96 hours, I will get your exam back unless something happens and I will let you know. For those of you bad at math, that's three days, right? Or so. Four. Ooh, I, very good. All right. So I, I tell them that you're going to get this back. And that changes their expectation. It realigns their expectation. So when I get it back in three, that's awesome. I tell them an email. I'll, I'll answer your email within 24 hours. They're used to like that, right? I emailed you two hours ago. I told them. I realign their expectations. And that's what anchoring is. This is where you can expect things. And it's amazingly effective. I had no idea. So if you're teaching, be doing that. All right, default. Let's talk about default. That's a simply opt-in, opt-out kind of stuff. NDSU has a 401k plan and some other plan I don't understand. Are we opt-in or opt-out? When you join it, do you have to sign up for it or is it already there? It's there. The university has an incredible contribution to this, but you have to sign up, right, to have your own contribution coming out, right? It's an opt-in. So... I didn't discover that until I was here for a long time and the benefits person changed who was opting me in every year, but it's an opt-in. So if you want somebody to have a 401k, you want them to save for their future, you might just have a policy where you opt them in. And that's what the military has. The military increased their life insurance policies to $500,000. And it was an opt it out. It just happened to... It used to be 400, it happened a couple months ago. So they automatically assigned me, which I pay for about $20 a month. I mean, that's a, I have $500,000 in life insurance. I'm worth more to my children like dead than alive, right? Which they pointed out more than once. Um, 
Why does the military do that? Well, if you have soldiers dying or people dying um, and you want their families taken care of, you don't want bad press. You want, okay, your soldier died. We're sorry. Here's $500,000, right? If you don't want it, you have to opt out. So it's incredibly effective to have a default. Um, this is a really old study. It's 20 years old, but is my favorite. These are, these are organ donation rates in some European countries and others. What's the difference? Right, opt-in. These countries, you're, everybody's an organ donation unless you say otherwise. This is 20 years ago, so the numbers have changed. Don't quote me on the numbers, right? The ones over there, you have to tell them you want to be an organ donor. What is, do you suppose, the organ donation rate in the United States? It's grown immensely in the past 20 years. What percent of people in the United States are organ donors? What? 10? Think it's higher, lower? It's the best guess so far. How, how high is it? How many of you are organ donors? If, I, if you're comfortable answering. Whoa, 50%, who said that? That is correct. 50% of the people. And that's an amazingly large number. Did you know that in Colorado, 69% are organ donors? In New York City, 27% are organ donors. Or not New York City, you know, it's, you know it's, uh, New York State, right? It's low. Where do you become an organ donor? The DMV, right? And look at North Dakota, we're always better at everything, right? 54%, right? Oh, this is the, the new, the most recent um, driving license application. For North Dakota. Look at question number one. Wow. If you don't hit yes, you're not an organ donor. But if you answer yes, of course you are an organ donor. It's pretty hard not to answer yes to that question unless you really don't like the concept. So this is, even though we're an opt-in kind of situation with organ donation, um, it makes it it, it's almost like opt out. You, you, you have the question posed to you directly and that's really helped. So defaults are amazingly good. Um, try to be the default. How many of you have the same wireless carrier that you had when you first got your cell phone? Raise them up high. How many of you now keep them up if you're, you still think that's the best choice if you were to do it again? Some people that don't have the same carrier believe that, right? How many of you think you should switch maybe or at least look into it? Nobody but me and Frame, right? Right, because it's a default, right? We, we got it once and, and now we stick with it. Now, the biggest switching cost, the biggest cost of picking somebody else, they got rid of. What was that in cell phone service? Number portability. They made it so, and you can imagine who argued for that, right? But they reduced the switching costs. So they're trying to make things easy for you to make the decision, but we still stick with people that we're not that happy with, right? We tend towards making a decision, which is I'm not making a decision. That's a decision, right? We tend towards not doing things, even if we know they're good for us. So the strategy, of course, for companies is to lower the switching costs, make it easy for them to become your customer or entice them with an amazing deal, right? All right, that's heuristics. Saliency, I love this picture. Anybody saw her or someone like her with Liberty Tech, right? I just love them. She's, she's awesome, right? That would be an awesome job, right? Saliency is a concept. It, it essentially means something to the effect of people are interested and tend towards things that are novel or draw an emotional response, but it also looks at if we make a little change, a minor little change in something that they don't really notice, right? In behavioral economics. Now, these are cheesy eggs. I just love food, right? In general, I guess I could say I love cheesy eggs, but I really love, do you like food, President Cook? Do you like cheesy eggs? Okay. Do you go to a lot of banquets as the president, right? <laughs> do you want me to answer that? I didn't go to the, the evaluating people once they're full lesson. So oh, wait, um, cheesy eggs, right? They're great. 
So all they did is um, cheesy eggs show up, right? They're always at the beginning of the buffet. You have cheesy eggs and you have bacon and ham and all these wonderful things and you load up your plate, right? I tell my kids right away, you need to look at the whole buffet before you start taking stuff. It's like a walking on rule, right? It's a good rule, right? I want you to see what's all there. It didn't change what they took, right? So all this economist did is change the order. They do a lot of food studies. So they change the order. So they put the good food for you for breakfast in the front. Cheesy eggs were last, right? What do you suppose happened? People took uh, more cheesy eggs. No, they put, this is, uh, the people in black are the people who had the, the sort of um, good food first, right? And the people in, in gray had the more healthy food first. So what do you notice? Yeah, it, it, more of what you ran into, but it wasn't just that. It was the cheesy egg people that line took 31% more food. I mean, who's not going to take that kind of food, right? When you have cheesy eggs and bacon. Do you like bacon? Yeah, both of you. No? Yes? Okay. That's okay. I'd be behind you in a buffet line any day then, right? Okay, so all they did was change the order. All they did was make a little teeny change in something at, and influence the way people behave. And in this case, they had a goal to make people eat healthier, right? A lot of intervention studies, he's shaking his head. He didn't like this study either, right? So my grad student, they have a lot of these kind of studies, whether you can get people to do healthy things. And I have a graduate student right now who's not here. I don't see any of our grad students here. Okay, all right. Anyway, she, she, had an, she had an idea, it's her own idea, to get people to use the stairs at Barry Hall, right? So there's Barry Hall, those of you who don't spend a lot of time down it. So essentially, she thought if she put signage up that talks about like physical activity will add years to your life or it's healthy and so on, right at the elevator and right at the stairs that people would use the staircase rather than the elevator, right? And then a week later, she added those footprints were not very popular, apparently, because uh, they thought it was like a COVID thing, like you have to walk this far apart. But the idea was, was she wanted people to use the stairs rather than the elevator. Did it work? It, it, it took a week, but it worked. It increased 31% of the people increased their use of the stairs, right? I don't have all the data yet, but it did work and it persevered. She took down the sounds, signs about a week or a month ago and people are still using the stairs. Are you guys using the stairs? Okay. Okay. Everybody's perfect. William, oh, <laughs> William works out at the gym. He told me that, right? We had counting, we had in the back stairs, we had counters, but in the front stairs, we had grad students sitting at the Barry Hall coffee shop, literally telling when people used it or not, which made me use the stairs every time, right? All right, so that's saliency. The last one I'm gonna talk about is social norms, um, the herding instinct. If you want a funny story, I'll tell you. Um, Afghanistan, funny story about Ashi. But in the meantime, we do stuff and we look around us to others to see whether it's the right stuff. It's a cue to us that we're doing what we should be doing, right? Social cues have been around forever. For example, um, you know, when I grew up, you don't farm on Sundays. You don't farm on Sundays, period. You know, we have this new social cue at our house. It's you don't use plastic bags. Wow, my daughter decided she we would not use plastic bags, which I spent a lot of time getting home from the grocery store, like getting opening the back, putting stuff into reusable bags for a while, but now I'm good, right? There are certain rules we look around us for what we should be doing. It's not just here in academia or it's it's not just human nature. Does anybody play Candy Crush? Oh, come on, really? I play Candy Crush and watch TV and so on while I'm exercising so I can forget. Oh. But I played Candy Crush, so I'm not very good at it, I lost. And, and Candy Crush told me more than 59% of players who used extra coins or something won this round. You know, be one of us. It's okay to do this. So they're giving you some kind of social cues. All right, so we talked about that. I am a hurry, speed, fast now, right? This is how we change behavior, right? We stop bad behavior by taxing it or banning it or so on. 
Um, we reward good behavior, the incentives, I can, the subsidy, NDUS system gives me, uh, pays my gym membership, right? The uh, reward, Moorhead, I don't know if they do it in Fargo, the Moorhead police ride around and they give coupons for ice cream to children that have their bike helmet on. And she's like, I can get one of those. Right, so they we try to reward people for doing it. Right, um, the downside: we are interfering with people's lives. We are manipulating them, regardless of how how much we care about them. And our objective is social good um, from the from the sort of social side. But of course, we have firms doing it. People may feel manipulated, and they want freedom. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples of reactants. Any electrical engineers? That's not that kind of reactants, okay? Yeah. We're talking about something different. Um, anyone recognize this? I wrote this down because I, I couldn't believe it. It's the Bloomberg problem, right? Mayor Bloomberg of New York City. But it actually was not him. I'm hoping I can find it because it's... The North... New York Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And somebody had to come up with a name, right? That's awesome. That's their health department. That's awesome, right? They put on a campaign that we shouldn't be drinking the big soda, right? And so they wanted to ban these sodas and just have this soda available at fast food restaurants and when you went into the grocery store or the gas station, anything with a, with a fountain. They said, hey, you know, people have freedom. They can buy two 16-ounce sodas if they want to. But the idea was if we take away those big gulps, people will drink less. How many of you think that works? Okay. All right. So what happened? Well, somebody did an experiment and, uh, about reactants, and they essentially, this concept means that you, it's not only not effective, but it makes things worse. So they put people in a room, and they either gave them some information about this attempt by Mayor Bloomberg to take away those freedoms, or they just gave them some random information to read. They each got a soda. They were instructed to take the cap off and enjoy while they were answering a survey, right? So this is what happened. The people that got the news article about uh, Mayor Bloomberg proposing this or the New York Department of Health and Mental Hygiene drank a lot more soda while they were answering the survey. Right. And in our own study, you go ahead and read this. This was from a survey from our own STAIR study. I want to know who is this you, Jeremy? Okay. <laughs> Don't tell me. This person said, I know what you're doing. You're manipulating me. So I'm going to use the elevator. Right. People do this kind of stuff. So the key is that they, you don't want to, you want to make sure they don't know they're being manipulated. Right. And people don't like bands. They don't like Big Brother. Do you remember this? You guys have kids that age, right? Turns out you can't, ketchup has sugar in it. Who would have known, right? So they can't have ketchup. They can't have salt. So people didn't say stay out of our business. This was a, an attempt to change school lunches, right? Because the federal government doesn't ban school lunches. They don't ban how fast. How many of you remember the 55 mile an hour driving rule, right? The federal government said everybody's going to draw 55 miles an hour, right? Do you, do you have any idea how hard it is to drive 55 miles an hour? It takes forever. The federal government didn't make it a rule. They said, okay, you states do whatever you want. That's your right, but we'll withdraw highway funding. And this school lunch thing was the same. You guys have any lunches you want at your schools in your states, but you won't be getting any subsidies from us. Right? So we have these school lunches. People don't like bans. And people are very good about arguing it. They don't say we don't like bans. They say this will have these the following effects. But people don't like it. This is my daughter's quote. Noticing you're being manipulated is sometimes just creepy. And I didn't save the right one, but this was, did you get these ballots? Right? This one says, for example, you should vote and here's your voting record is, is average, right? What it doesn't show is it actually sent me something and said when I voted. I did vote in 2018. I didn't vote in 2019. I was like, creepy. The reality is nobody sees this, right? It's a machine that automatically sends them out. Nobody's judging me. You didn't vote that year. But man, I went and voted for sure, right? It's public record. It's a little creepy, right? 
is a little creepy that that all this information is available to us. And the last thing I want to say is, is uh, it's, it's sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes you do something and it doesn't work. We don't publish it often because we don't publish, you know, no result papers. But I want to tell you something about the back stairs at Barry Hall. Have you guys been there, spent some time there, President Cook? Okay. Have you ever used the back stairs? Now, NDSU is very security minded and they did the right thing. They, they, it, it, they put locks on it. So you have to scan your card to get upstairs on the elevator or to get out of the stairway. Right? We did that because of security concerns. It was a good job. What turns out, and I, I didn't even realize it, but I do this as well. Somebody wrote on our survey, well, I used to use the stairs, but now you can just scan your card, get in the elevator, get go to your office and get out. But if you use the stairs, you have to find your keys and open the door and so on, right? So our, our attempt at safety, we, we didn't step back and see, and who would have known? Um, I take the elevator back there too now because I can't find my keys and, and it's not an easy process. But sometimes we make changes and we're not sure how that will affect things. So we need key scanners at every stairway. Do we get that? Oh. Okay, excellent. All right, so that's it. Um, I, I, I guess I stop now and you're supposed to ask questions, but you can just say stuff because I know there's lots of you who wanna say stuff. Can use mine. <laughs> Walk up to everyone. Uh, questions. Girl, can I just yell it out? Yeah. Um, you, you gave us a, a, a picture with goats or sheep, and you said there's a story about. Oh, you want to know? And I okay. and I remember that right. I'm enticed. Here it is, and I think I, I remember Margaret was one time I sent a story. I used to send stories from Afghanistan as a way to sort of vent, and they didn't say this guy died or something. They were trying to be funny, right? So I it was it was a I, I don't even know the 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 New Year right for for the workers. I didn't go out with guards, American guards usually. I went out with the Afghan or third country national guards in a, in a unit called Tundra. And they sent me out with these people because these people, to be quite frankly, could stop things that our soldiers could not. If kids are throwing rocks at me, our soldiers, you know, that's why we have Kevlar. Um, these people could, could take care of business. So they often sent them out with me on my missions. And so I wanted to, they, they don't make a lot of money. So I wanted to buy them a sheep for their new year so they could have good food, right? So. I've been all around livestock all my all my life, right? So I thought it's too easy. I went with my interpreter. He bargained. We bought a sheep, right? That picture of sheep, sheep like I, I'd never raised sheep, but sheep like to be together, right? So I tried to take this sheep away from the other sheep, and I brought a rope, right? And and um, you know, I thought I would just a lead and just, but none of the sheep was having none of this, right? So the sheep, um, I was trying to pull it along, and um. You know, it's a dangerous place, right? And Tundra Mike, who's an American, was in charge of these other guys. And he he's awesome. You know, he, he I, awesome today. But he he approached us. He was out in front of me. And I was dragging along my sheep, right? And then I saw him. And he came running at me. And he took out this gigantic machete. He carried like four different weapons and he comes running at me. And I thought for sure there was a, you know, Taliban or something behind me. So I dropped it on the ground and he stopped at the sheep and he cut the thing because I was choking the sheep and it had fallen down. So I, I have these pictures. It's not funny to you, but it was hilarious to me because I almost peed my pants, right? Because I thought something bad was going on. So the lesson I learned is, is um, I have some pictures I can show you later where, where the, the Afghan police were out and about because it was spring fighting season, right? So they actually picked up the sheep and put it in the back of one of their pickups and, and, and took it in, but they were laughing so hard. It was, it was, it was I would have been embarrassed if I knew what was going on, right? Thank you for allowing me to share. Nobody have a question? Yes, oh. With the Barry Hall stair, how do you operate? I mean, are you, do you have a, how do you, who's doing the 
observation to see what decisions. Oh, that's a make. good question. So there's two things. One in the back stairs, there's nowhere for people to sit and observe. Um, although we could use a coffee shop back there too, if you're thinking about it. But um, so we had a counter. We actually had something that counted as people walk by, either in the elevator or stairs. In the front stairs, how many of you go to Berry Hall? All right. In the front stairs, we had somebody having coffee for eight hours. You know, <laughs> those were our grad students, right? Um, and just tallied the people. That one went through IRB like nothing. It was fast because we do, we tried to do something else and it didn't work. But just watching people is okay. Hi, Cheryl. Hi, you go ahead. So now you guys can see how lucky we are to have Cheryl in our in our department. Mm -hmm. But thank you. It was so great to to have this. Now I'm going to ask the hardball question. <laughs> so you talked initially a bit of the uh, difficulties that modern. I, mean, I shouldn't say much classical economics has in explaining some behavior and you're offering behavioral economics as a solution to say perhaps the, I would call it the positive question of how people behave how they actually do things um, but you didn't address what I would refer to as the normative issues right so what 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 does behavioral economics offer us in terms of thinking then about not the how do people actually behave, but how they should behave. And I'll throw a, a big, even bigger wrinkle you can into the keep question. Talking because I'm not going to answer your question. But, <laughs> but do explain positive versus normative for them while you're talking. Well, a positive question would be how do people actually behave? The normative question would be how should they behave? Or if you want to do something that's in the in society's interest, how would you determine whether or not something is truly the right thing to do. And then the other flip side, the, I think the deeper question, because th this is part of the modern debate, and I'm just curious to hear your take, but there's an issue of, we apply this behavioral economics that people are not rational, but we usually then believe that the people making the decisions and the rules, those who are determining the nudge <laughs> are in fact rational is over <laughs> well so I, that was i told you there's the smoking gun <laughs> I, I i i pride myself in that i have taught all these students right i they don't know if i'm pro-life or pro-choice they don't know if i believe in the death penalty or not i'm hoping they don't know if i'm a republican or a democrat and, and i pride myself in that i'm really good at not sharing sometimes it's very challenging do you want to share what should be no <laughs> So it, it's it's hard. It's hard. I, he's talking about positive. We can just say what is, explain what's going on. Normative um, is is a job for society, and the way we choose to do that right now is through our legislature, our Congress, and then of course our administrative, our president and governor, and so on. But do they have full information? No, they rely on hopefully experts. I'm. <laughs> Oh, sorry. So I think you make a really good case that the rational model is is not accurate. But but the question I would have for you is is if behavior is not rational, is it is it also random in its irrationality, or is it non-random? Is it patterned in its irrationality? Does that make sense? So I I would. I would say I, we run these econometric models where we try to estimate things and we get this, we account for all kinds of things that are going on in the world, in the market and so on. And, and we get this error term, right? And if we see a systematic you know, thing over time, we have a trend variable or whatever it is. Um, I, I think your question is, can we predict yeah, irrationality? Yeah. Is, is irrationality predictable? Yes. And that's the cool thing about these experiments are, are they are very inexpensive. It is very inexpensive to do a behavioral nudge. People don't seem to notice. You don't have to get politicians involved. So even if we don't know, but we suspect we can test it. And how many of you are parents or raised kids, your nieces, right? You, you've done this all your lives, right? You try something out and see if it works, right? They have parenting books, but we know better, right? So, um, so I, I think it does have a pattern and, and therefore we should be able to explain it, but that's you're a psychologist, so maybe that's where you take in, right?
that was an awesome lecture. Um, so my question is kind of related. So you said you've done a lot of work with farmers and I'm curious about, is there a, have you seen a difference with farmers compared to like the general population um, in terms of that, that, I guess that pattern aspect as well in terms of their, how they behave and make decisions, I guess. Um, you know, I get the most insight from farmers. I, I have, I'm not gonna share exactly what it is, but I get the most insight about how farmers behave from listening to their children. And there's something that NDSU and the extension service is very focused on getting our farmers to develop estate and succession plans. How are we going to take the farm and, and pass it on to the future generation, particularly when other children are involved? Um, so we want them to sit down with their families and have good, solid discussions, right? Adult children, yes. Um, so I, I have a speaker come in and talk about this, for example. We're trying to get the idea. It's more about getting the parents to sit down and have these hard conversations while the parents are still, still alive and so on. Um, the children, some of them see their their parents as, I don't want to say, I'll say close-minded because I can't think of a better word, but it's it's how we do the heuristics and, and how we do the salience thing. It's it's what what we know. And it's hard for me to understand some of these things. And and so farming has changed a lot. And I think in general, in North Dakota, our farmers are very progressive. They're very well educated. Um, so I, in that regard, they're not different. Um, I, I'm just talking myself into a circle. I, farming is interesting to me to work with farmers because farmers have amazing insight and they have an incredible wealth that they need to decide what to do with. And they operate in an environment that has an enormous amount of risk. I mean, it's not just weather risk, price volatility has never been higher and so on. So these are really intelligent people who are operating with a, with a lot of equity and they are trying to make decisions in a world that has an incredible amount of uncertainty. Um, that said, um, I, I think like anything else, they, they need heuristics for that reason. They need to make decisions. They make some decisions based on anchoring on what, what their father did and so on. Um, but I, I don't think they're any different. That's a really long answer to a question, but I'm so proud of our farmers here. I just, it's so exciting. Uh oh. Thank you for the presentation. In addition to your research, it's very evident why you are such an admired teacher here at NDSU. It was really enjoyable. Um, I'm going to give you my question first, and then I'll offer the context for oh, it. Can you offer the answer? Uh, yeah. I don't know the answer, right. so I'm okay. hoping that we All can right. work toward it. Uh, it has to do with how we can assist in teaching people decision-making skills, which you were getting at in your response in regard to farmers. And I'm thinking about it in the context of college students. And I'm thinking about retention. We had a really impactful speaker come and talk about how students spend you know, however many years in K-12 where a lot of decisions are made for them. Mm -hmm. And then they arrive here in their first year and suddenly there's a lot of decisions for them to make. And there are some that may seem more apparent to us in terms of the social norm of should I go to class or not go to class? But there's also decisions like, what should my major be? What is my path after school? What, how do I uh, sort of negotiate this tension between the family that I'm caring for and like my academic studies? What does behavioral economics offer in terms of thinking of how we might build better curriculum or talk to students about building those decision-making skills. Okay, I'll just take that one. Um, oh, okay. Um, can I just ignore your behavioral economics part of that question? Because we are doing amazing things here. We're, we're focused on retention the, from the top down, um, from the bottom up. We want our students to come here. We want our students to stay, right? How do we get them to stay? We're taking the right steps, right? Focus on advising. Focus on, I got an email, you've all gotten it about making Blackboard available so they know what's going on, right? Because this is sort of a pivotal time for the new students. It's kind of their first time sometimes away from home, making these kind of decisions, right? And they're not always big decisions, but putting placing the advising in a central location so it doesn't depend on whether the advisor is available or willing to take the time to get to know. They should all have the same experience, right? Um, I, I, it's, to, to me, it's about empathy and, and 
showing the student that they care and putting them in an environment to make decisions where failure is celebrated as much as success. And I think the focus at this university on experimental learning, um, getting the kids involved in things and, and to be honest, showing them you care. It has nothing to do with behavioral economics. We could, we could do that as a research project later when I think about it, I'm not standing up here because um, it's a, probably a good idea. There's ways we can manipulate them into staying. <laughs> Nobody's arguing with me yet. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I like what you just said, so I'm not going to argue. Um, uh, so I've just spent the last four months in Bismarck, and the entire time you were talking, I was thinking about what does behavioral economics, what kind of lens, or how does it help us think about the legislative process? Any thoughts on that? Sure. I, I think um, there's a lot of psychological literature that essentially saying arguing with people who have a different opinion is not very effective, but asking them about their opinion can help them understand your own. For example, I'm a strong believer in some of these opinions are based on sort of a factual understanding. I'm a firm believer in that the pro-life, pro-choice debate for a lot of people is whether you think that individual is, is a human being, a fetus, right? It, other people have other reasons, you know, you shouldn't blah, blah, blah. But the idea is, is there's a fundamental understanding in this country, like I used to go to France a lot, and when we elected George Bush, I got calls from everybody in France. They said, how could you elect him? He's, he was a governor of Texas. How could you do that? And I said, well, what do you mean, right? And they're like, they kill people. It was just about the death penalty. That's all they were concerned about because it's a cultural thing. The people that invented the guillotine, right? Um, it's a cultural thing. So behavioral economics, uh, legislatures are a unique group of individuals, um, like doctors who receive their accreditation from those surrounding them in, in a particular locale. Um, sometimes we argue stuff that just cannot be argued. Um, I think in ag and in NDSU in general did an excellent job this year as, as in past, but, um, you're trying to, you're trying to persuade them. So I'm just answering because I don't know the answer. I'll think about it and get back to you. But it is a, a challenge. You all have a challenge because you're you're trying to shift a mindset. You're trying to provide facts without providing too many facts, right? You're trying to reach them on an emotional level. So I, I would have liked to be there and watch. Was it fun? Do you think it was fun? It was fun. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, was it interesting? Is your first legislative session? You know, I, I could talk for an hour on that question. Um, I, I did have one of these moments where we were, I was trying to persuade, I won't get into the political issue, but just trying to persuade dec decision makers, legislators to adopt something I thought was made a lot of sense. And so, and, and I thought that it was an issue of understanding. And so uh, I thought the, my role was to educate. And so drove to Bismarck one night, had a dinner and with the right people and it was the right people. And we talked it through. And then the next day to, you know, explain the issue to the next folks. And, you know, ultimately didn't really get what I wanted. Got some, but not all. Um, and it struck me, actually, somebody made the point to me is I'd love to tell you, I would have discovered it on my own, but they just sort of said, you know, they, it's not that they don't understand. It's that they they're enjoying this. <laughs> and I thought that was just kind of spec. And, and it, I, in hindsight, I'm like, yeah, that's right. So, but then you think about so many decisions get made there at the last minute for lots of different reasons. I think a lot of decisions get made because they like somebody or they don't. And, and then, you know, and add 50 more variables. So, yeah. So it's kind of fascinating. Here's the cool thing. I, I, I'll have, you know, North Dakota, um, there are 36 states now that have seatbelt use as a primary offense. So they can pull you over if you are not doing anything wrong, but you don't have your seatbelt on, right? North Dakota is um, 45th out of 50 in terms of people using their seatbelts. We have 84% compliance rate. That's not really good because um, the science shows that I think it's 43% of car accidents that are fatal or because somebody didn't have a seatbelt on, right? Then you have people flying through the air and like that. But, but here's the deal. The North Dakota legislature only meets every two years, and they have been debating this ad nauseum, right? Because it's like a slippery slope idea. First, 
I don't know if you guys are old enough. We didn't have seatbelts, right? And then they want you to wear it. They make a rule. And then they make it so they can pull you over if you don't use your blinker right and also ticket you. So it's kind of like a the whole slippery slope, which is what people are afraid of. This legislative session, as of August 1st, you're all going to be wearing seatbelts. And if you're not, as a primary offense, they can pull you over in North Dakota. It was a squeaky margin. But the process he's decide, discovering, nothing changed, right? Nothing changed in North Dakota. We still like our freedom and so on. But eventually they got enough people on this side. And, and I would guess it has nothing to do with science, right? I could argue science all day why we should wear seatbelts. But it, it has to do with this process that you enjoyed. You don't get to do it for two years. Well, not quite two years, but you and Greg Sorry. can commiserate. <laughs> what? Yeah, they're going to give us raises from what I heard from your previous presentation. So we like them. Seems to be I hate to bring all this fun oh, to an end. Is there a last God. question somebody has? All right, two questions that are related. Is it my child? It's not your child. Okay. No, I can I can guarantee that. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, in behaviorism, there's an emphasis on actions without an emphasis on mental states. Okay. How is behavioral economics different since it's based significantly on mental and emotional states? And the corollary to that is, is a nudge, a subtle form of conditioning. <laughs> can you interpret that for me? He, he can answer this question. Go ahead. That's a lot of psychology. Is that one of your colleagues? No, it's, it's not. <laughs> okay. So is it a conditioning form? Y yes. Yeah. You're, you're trying to influence, interfere with people's lives and get them to if that's his question, certainly it is. And is that wrong or right? That's a, he can, Jeremy can answer about the normative question. I didn't understand the rest of the question. I'm not really that smart. Did you? <laughs> I, 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 think, I think the first question is, is asking, I think the first question is asking, how does, how does behavioral economics differ from classical behaviorism uh, since one excludes mental and emotional states, the other includes mental and emotional states, and yet they use the same B word. Oh, I get it. I have no idea. <laughs> I, I don't know enough about this subject. So if you uh, tell that person to contact me, then they can educate me on this, because it's a great question. I imagine I just don't know the answer. Yeah. President I know Cook, it. could we please have you present the faculty lecture, lectureship award? How many people are online now? Rest, but thank you. That's actually a lot of Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cook. Oh. Uh, so this brings to the end this year's award ceremony. Make sure I'm standing in front of you here. No, I, 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 the faculty lectureship. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Walkenheim for such an impressive presentation. Uh, we had a lot of fun here uh, and for sharing everything with us. If you have other questions, please email them, Dr. Walkenheim, or simply come to the reception here uh, at Butte Lounge following this. So thank you very much. Thanks. We appreciate thank you. your presentation. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. There's food apparently, so yeah.